Okay, we're ready to get started. Uh, welcome everybody to the All You Need to Know About ANSI Z358.1. Uh, we're going to go over the, the standard in length today, uh, everything you need to know about it, and how to uh, remain compliant uh, with the standard. So to get started, I wanted to quickly remind everybody that uh, anytime during the webinar, you can ask questions. Uh, make sure you're using the, uh, the questions section on your control panel. Any questions that I don't answer during the Q&A at the end of the webinar uh, will be answered uh, by a uh, via uh, an email or in a follow-up email. So um, don't worry about that. We will eventually uh, we'll make sure to answer your questions. Uh, the webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be available on demand uh, 24 to 48 hours after the presentation. Um, and the poll questions uh, will be launched during the presentation. So uh, we really appreciate your participation in those. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, it helps us to further improve our product, make sure we're reaching um, uh, or providing the correct information to our customers uh, and that it's valid to you. Uh, my name is Justin Dunn. I am the sales product specialist slash trainer for Haas. Uh, with me is Samantha Hoke. Say hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Just kidding. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending. She is our marketing and communication strategist. Okay, uh, so we're going to go over our agenda real quick uh, and what's in store for you. Uh, and that is uh, we're going to go over the ANSI ISEA Z358.1 standard in length for you. Uh, the 2014 revision highlights uh, all the changes, the most recent changes and what we're currently trying to comply with. Uh, what the significant requirements of the standard are best practices for emergency equipment, and then uh, I will host a live Q&A at the end, uh, answering as many questions as I can possibly get to that you submitted during the webinar. Uh, so if you have a question, make sure you, uh, you ask it right away because we will get uh, back around to it, okay? Uh, now I'd like to start uh, each webinar thinking that uh, this could be your first webinar on OSHA or ANSI. Uh, so I'd like to give a brief explanation of who uh, OSHA is. So OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, and they are the agency responsible for regulating emergency shower and eyewash facilities. Uh, OSHA has its own standard regarding emergency first aid equipment. And that is 29 CFR 1910.151 subsection C. Uh, medical services and first aid. Now where the eyes or body of any person may be exposed to injurious corrosive materials, suitable facilities for quick drenching or flushing of the eyes and body shall be provided within the work area for immediate emergency use. This is kind of vague. This is all we get from OSHA. It's a single paragraph. Um, it doesn't give us a lot of explanation as to how we need to go about accomplishing that. Um, and that's where ANSI and the ISEA come in. Uh, and I'll explain both of those. Uh, now a little bit about the importance of compliance, uh, and certainly in regards to OSHA. Um, what we're trying to accomplish and what we should all be trying to accomplish is reducing injuries and fatalities at work, lowering workplace risk, and then lowering the potential for lost time and money, both for the employee, for the employer, uh, potential uh, litigation, lawsuits, things like that, all that ugly stuff we wanna try to avoid. Now, OSHA has stepped up enforcement, uh, particularly for employee, uh, employers who have a history of serious or repeated violations. Obviously, they're going to keep a much closer eye on them. On August 1st of 2016, uh, OSHA fines increased for the first time since 1990 by 80%. Um, effective January 2nd, 2018, OSHA fines have increased by an additional 2% to account for inflation. This was due to the Inflation, inflation Adjustment Act of 2015. So for a willful violation, for example, something that was previously $70,000 uh, for a violation has gone up to $126,000 for a willful violation. And seeing as OSHA uh, visits about 39,000 organizations a year, um, we wanna make sure that we are in compliance and that we are paying attention to the changes uh, to the standards. This map is just an example of uh, how wide uh, and vastly different um, the array of fines can be across the U.S. Uh, you're going to see some pretty notable names on here. This is all public information. Uh, we're not calling anybody out here, but I wanted to give everybody a couple of examples of what some of those fines are and what those violations were. Uh, so I'm just going to start with uh, the biggest one on the page, uh, up in the top left-hand corner, Bay Area Athletic Club. Uh, 
Uh, this is in Oregon. Uh, the violation was that the employees were working with extreme pH chemicals and uh, weren't provided uh, approved eyewashes and or safety stations uh, or shower stations to properly give them first aid if, in the event of an emergency. Now, the total penalty was almost $200,000. Um, and just to give you an example of it, of how broad this is, I mean, it can really be any organization if you're dealing with a chemical that's potentially harmful to a human being. Uh, quality Christmas tree, a garden center in Houston, Texas, uh, is a $25,000 penalty, and they were dealing with corrosive ch chemicals, and they didn't have an eyewash uh, readily accessible. I would have probably argued that should have been an eyewash, uh, eye face wash and shower since it was corrosive. But uh, USPS, uh, Seattle bulk shipping, uh, none of us are, are necessarily safe, which is why paying attention is, is so critical. Now, uh, what is ANSI, what is the ISCA, uh, and what is the Z358.1 standard? Uh, the standard itself was written by the International Safety Equipment Association, and it defines emergency eyewash and shower design, location and temperature requirements for proper functionality and usage, and OSHA references the ANSI ISEA standard uh, during site inspections and violation reporting, and it's a, the recognized source for guidance on how to comply with OSHA's own standard, 1910.151C. So that's how uh, ANSI and the ISEA standards, E358.1, is, is relevant to what they're doing. Now, the ANSI standard uh, was first published in 1981. It was revised in 1990, 98, 2004, 2009, and 2014. A couple of those revisions gave us bigger changes than others did. Um, and a couple notable ones, most recent, were the 2009 revision, gave us some of the biggest changes uh, for compliance that we've ever had. Firstly being temperature range for water delivery, simultaneous use requirements, eyewash testing requirements, uh, I'll make sure to go over all of these uh, later on in the presentation. And then in 2014, uh, this was more geared towards manufacturers of emergency equipment, uh, making sure that we were manufacturing them in a way that was uh, allowing for their installation in your facilities to be compliant. So design, manufacture, and installation of emergency showers, equipment installation locations, and adjusted measurements throughout the standard. Now, uh, Fed OSHA, or the Feds, I like to call them, uh, Federal Occupation Safety and Health Act, uh, OSHA Act, is a preemptive uh, act, meaning it overrides state laws and regulations. It's the gold standard. It's what all of us have to uh, comply to. Now, individual states, uh, as long as their requirements are more stringent than the federal standards, uh, can devise their own laws and regulations. And uh, for example, Cal OSHA is a, a very prominent um, example of that. Um, and uh, that they have their own laws above and beyond what the federal OSHA has required of us. Uh, now, uh, I promise you poll questions. This is the first one. Uh, Samantha, I think we have four total. Uh, she's gonna launch the first one for us. Thanks, Justin. Um, we'd like to know what best describes your role when it comes to choosing emergency shower and eye face wash products. Do you decide or make a recommendation? Do you install or maintain the product? Do you place the order for the product? Do you specify the product or do you not have an active role? For each of these polls, we're going to keep them open for about 45 seconds just to allow all attendees to participate and then we'll pass it back over to Justin. Great, thank you everybody. Okay, thanks Sam. Uh, so moving on, we're gonna go into the significant requirements of the standard. Um, so to start with, uh, all equipment, eye washes, eye face washes, showers, and any combination of those types of equipment, first must be accessible within 10 seconds. Now all of us are built differently, um, each of us are uniquely human in different ways, and not all of us can cover 10 seconds in uh, the same amount of time. Uh, it's different for all of or the same distance in 10 seconds. So it's different for all of us. So what they did in the appendix of the ANSI standard, they gave us a 55-foot rule. So uh, this gave us a measurable distance uh, from the hazard 
to the first aid equipment, um, and it must be within that distance. Uh, we obviously suggest that uh, emergency equipment be as close as is safe uh, to the hazard as possible. Um, obviously, we want it to be far enough away so you're not continually exposed while trying to receive first aid, but if it's reasonable to do so as, as close as possible to the hazard so they can re receive immediate first aid. Uh, now, it needs to be located on the same level as the hazard. Uh, now, in the photo on the left, you'll see some of our HAWS integrated equipment. Uh, these booths have combination units in them, my face wash, showers, um, and allow for the user to have tempered water uh, as well as it be heated or cooled, depending on the area. Uh, on the left side of the photo, you can see sodium hydroxide. Uh, this is better known as caustic soda. Uh, now, in the event of a burst on a tank like this, uh, it's likely going to spray. So they have units on the top deck and on the floor um, in this area to make sure that if, if wherever somebody may be exposed, they have access to emergency equipment. This is a really smart way to do it. Um, so uh, no steps um, in between uh, equipment. Luckily, they have one on the high and low end of this uh, photo. Uh, now, it needs to be free of obstructions. Uh, again, referring to the photo, uh, somebody accidentally parked a, uh, a tank in front of one of the showers. It may be hard to access. Uh, we want to make sure that your path from the hazard to the emergency equipment is as clear as possible. Okay, We need to assume that somebody who is just sprayed with chemicals um, or uh, had dirt, dust, uh, debris uh, into their eyes, uh, we need to make sure that they, they probably don't have very good use of their eyes, and we need to make sure they have a clear path so that they can reach the emergency equipment safely. Okay, There's an exception to this, Appendix B, uh, where a door is allowed into emergency equipment. Uh, now, that door has to meet certain specifications. Uh, it has to be non-locking, uh, first and foremost. Uh, it has to have a push bar or panic bar operated door, uh, so it can't have a handle. Um, it has to open in the direction of the emergency equipment, uh, and the hazard must be non-corrosive. Uh, that's sometimes something we can't get away from, uh, and we have to provide equipment uh, like the one you see in the photo. Um, but as long as it all meets those requirements, we're allowed to have a door. Sometimes the room in which you're uh, exposed to this hazard chemical, uh, we need to escape that room, and that means there's a door protecting you from that hazard and emergency equipment on the other side. So. It's important to remember that a single door is allowed as long as it meets those requirements. Moving on, the area needs to be well lit. Uh, it needs to be identified with highly visible signage. Uh, again, referring to the left, you can obviously see the booth is pointing to which direction the door is in. It has a sign. It's telling you there's a shower and there's an uh, eye face wash here in this location. The unit needs to go from off to on in one second or less, and it needs to remain on without the use of the operator's hands. This is but both of these are very important. Again, off to on, uh, there is a misconception out there that it's one motion uh, in the standard, um, and that comes down to uh, state requirements. There are a handful of states that require one motion activation, uh, but the majority of us have to uh, comply with uh, off to on in one second or less. Yeah, and Justin, I think that misconception you were you were referencing, it ties into what we were talking about earlier that um, any state or even company or building or county can create their own standards that are equal to or more stringent than the federal OSHA. So um, that conception of the one motion activation is actually very popular and we see it a lot in um, uh, locations like hospitals and whatnot. So um, a lot of particular eyewash equipment is not valid when it comes to the one motion activation. So it is interesting. It's just something to make sure that you're always checking your uh, local codes when it comes to equipment like this and the standard. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and going back to the uh, operator's hands, um, this is really important because self-closing valves used to be a really prevalent um, type of valve that was used on emergency equipment. And what you would have to do is constantly hold the shower open, constantly hold the eye face wash open. Um, and this can be really difficult to do. You have other emergencies to deal with, uh, removing your clothing, holding your eyes open, um, and any other emergencies that might arise. So a stay open valve is what's required on this equipment uh, now. Uh, now, the del uh, delivery of the flushing fluid has to be for a full 15 minutes. Um, this is a long time, and uh, depending on this chemical that you are exposed to, it can be even longer. 
Um, so a full 15 minutes is required, that's standard, uh, but as you can see at the bottom of the slide, strong alkalis uh, have a suggested 60 minute flush. That's a long time to remain in emergency uh, first aid equipment, uh, showers and eye face washes, um, which makes compliance with this standard even more important because uh, we want to take into uh, consideration uh, victim comfort. Now, all other corrosives uh, can be a 30-minute flush. It just depends, depends on the severity of the uh, corrosive caustic chemicals that you may have been exposed to. But 15 minutes is the, the standard. Uh, now, all equipment needs to provide a controlled flow of flushing fluid at a velocity low enough to be non-injurious to the user. So you can see in the video, we have a, a good dispersion from the shower, um, it's actually much gentler than you than you might see, think in the photo. It's kind of like rain falling on your back. Uh, it's dispersed evenly across his body. The eye face wash doesn't have an injurious flow. Um, and this is typically a, a pretty serious issue as a lot of times um, in facilities, we can see they've plumbed too much water or too little water. In this example, too much water would lead to an injurious flow. We have uh, an eye wash head that's shooting 20 feet one way and 20 feet the other, and uh, we, we like to call those brain washes uh, here. Um, but we want to provide, again, a comfortable experience, and we don't want to blow their eyes out on top of them already being injured. I think a key takeaway on this slide is those who are specifying emergency eye washes and showers is one thing to really look into with the different manufacturers is who provides uh, flow control to ensure that we are providing um, non-injurious flow to the user. That's that's definitely a key takeaway here. Yep, what you see in the photo is our, our Axion head and our Axion eye face wash. Uh, both have flow controls uh, limiting the amount of water to the ANSI minimums, which I'll go over here in a minute, um, making sure that the flow is non-injurious. Uh, now, shutoff valves are another important part of the standard. Um, in that if there is a shutoff valve installed in the supply line for maintenance purposes, provisions need to be made so that we prevent unauthorized shutoff. This usually means a lockout device for the shutoff valve, making sure that an employee doesn't inadvertently shut it off for some reason. Um, uh, it'd be a pretty irresponsible thing to do, but it does happen. Um, we do surveys here at Haas, a program that I oversee, and every once in a while, uh, the water is shut off to the unit. We have to reactivate, go back to the shower, and and finally activate and test it. So this is a big deal. If there's a shutoff valve, make sure that it is locked out um, to, to make sure that somebody has access to that water when they reach the equipment. Now, all drenched showers, uh, specifically, and they need to provide a column of flushing fluid at least 20 inches wide, average human shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder width, at 60 inches above the surface floor of the user, whatever floor they're standing on, 60 inches above that surface, again, average human height, uh, 20 inches wide, 60 inches above the ground is about our, our shoulder width. Uh, so we're just making sure that your entire body is covered by the spray of the shower head, um, that it's meeting these requirements so you have full body decontamination. Now flushing fluid column pattern uh, needs to be between 82 inches and 96 inches above the surface floor. This is important because if, if that shower head's too high, uh, it's dispersing the water too wide and it is not going to rinse your body appropriately. At 82 inches, uh, it may be too close and it may not be reaching you shoulder to shoulder. It may not cover your entire body. So within that range, we're making sure that your entire body is covered by the water. Now, the pull rod uh, cannot exceed 69 inches from the floor. Um, this is the maximum height that it can be positioned from the surface floor of the user, and that's because the taller amongst us, um, it's reasonable to think that they could at any height reach down or uh, to activate the pull rod. The shorter amongst us, we want to make sure that they can still reach the pull rod, they can still activate the equipment. Um, a lot of the times it's activated near the ceiling. I uh, think hospitals, for example, uh, they have tall ceilings and you need to provide an extra long pull rod so you meet that 69 inches so that somebody can actually activate the equipment. We don't want to prolong the activation. Now, uh, going over the um, water, the flushing fluid requirements for each of these pieces of equipment, eye washes need to provide 0.4 gallons per minute. An eye face wash needs to provide three gallons per minute because of the extra water that it's using to cover your entire face and eyes. 
And then a drenched shower is 20 gallons per minute, which is a lot of water. Um, your typical household shower does about 2.1 GPM, gallons per minute. Uh, that 20 GPM is about an 800 to 900 percent, 850 percent ish increase. And that's a lot of water uh, that's going to go into your facility. Um, and then a combination, obviously, an eye face wash and a drench shower would be 23 gallons. Eye, eye wash and a drench shower would be uh, 20.4 gallons per minute. Um, and that needs to run for 15 minutes, which means about 345 gallons per minute for that's going to go into your facility. And ANSI does not. Uh, take into consider drainage in your facility. So make sure that you're thinking about drainage and facility when you put this type of equipment in. Now, common uh, nation units uh, must be capable of operating simultaneously, uh, maintaining sufficient pressure and volume to the eye wash or the eye face wash and the shower when both are activated together. This is the most severe issue uh, out there in the field right now, is water is gonna take the path of least resistance through plumbing, always. Um, and that shower is outputting 20 GPM. The eye wash or the eye face wash on the units using a lot less water and oftentimes we'll activate that eye wash, that eye face wash will have perfect flow. As soon as we activate that shower, it disappears. Uh, there's not enough water to supply both and nobody's using flow controls to limit the amount of water coming out of the shower. We have 30 plus GPM coming out of there. It's sucking up all the water from the unit and there's nothing left for the eye or eye face wash. So make sure you're paying attention to that. It's a really severe problem. Now the uh, equipment needs to be positioned so that the components can be used simultaneously. You have to be able to use the eye wash or eye face wash and the shower at the same time. Uh, plumbers, contractors, sometimes uh, not versed in ANSI, will position the shower one way, the eye wash the other, and uh, think they're for separate situations and they're not. They need to be used at the same time. Uh, now for poll question number two. Uh, Sam, if you would launch that. Absolutely. On your screen, we'd like to know how many pieces of emergency equipment, which include portable eye washes, uh, squeeze bottles, plumbed eye washes and showers, um, et cetera, do you have in your facility? Zero to 24, 25 to 50, 50 to 100, or more than 100? Perfect, thank you for participating. All right, moving on. <clears throat> so eye washes and eye face washes uh, need to meet the requirements of this gauge. This was re uh, given to us by the ANSI standard. Um, that illustration up there at the top right is directly from the ANSI standard and gives us directions on how to make this gauge. Uh, in the video, you can see our eye wash gauge working um, and Basically what's happening is you are measuring eight inches above that nozzle and slowly lowering that gauge to make sure that the eyewash streams are meeting the circles on the gauge. This is just based on average human eye spacing and making sure that the equipment is gonna work for somebody. Hey, sorry, Justin, our poll is not closing and people aren't able to see the screen. Let me mess around with this really quick. Sorry, everyone. Um, let's see. I'm uh, sorry. Sorry, guys. I guess we have some technical issues here. Uh, we'll work them as, as quick as we can. Let's try this. There we go. Perfect. Thanks for your patience on that. Okay, uh, we're back to going. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, so this is our eye wash gauge, <laughs> the thing I was previously talking about. Um, so measure to eight inches, just as you, I'm gonna let it roll one more time, lower the gauge to make sure it lines up with the eye wash. You can see the streams directly in the circles. And again, just based on average human eye spacing, making sure that the eye wash is gonna meet somebody's eyes when they use the equipment. Super simple. Now all nozzles, outlets, stored flushing fluid, uh, any outlet of water or stored water 
in emergency equipment needs to be protected against airborne contaminants. This just means dust covers need to be in place. Now, all equipment needs to deliver tepid flushing fluid between 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 16 degrees Celsius and 38 degrees Celsius for uh, my buddies up north. 75% um, of ophthalmologists say that having tempered water is very important, citing that it increases the chances that a victim can tolerate the 15 minute flush required. Uh, this is just a groundwater map. I wanted to give you guys an example of how different our, our groundwater is across the U.S. alone. Um, in the south, you have tepid water coming straight out of the ground, but that's not all season. I believe, if I remember correctly, this was taken in September. Um, but the further north you get, north of Tennessee, Arizona, we have cold groundwater that's going to enter our system. And the warm water that's inside of our facilities walls, it's not gonna last for a full 15 minutes usually. Eventually we're gonna be pulling cold groundwater and that can mean some negative effects for the person in the water. And I'll go over those. Now the importance of tepid water is first that it encourages the use of the safety equipment. If you know that water is scalding or freezing, uh, you're not gonna wanna get in there uh, for first aid, um, which could be detrimental to the effects of whatever it is that you were exposed to. Uh, it encourages the removal of your contaminated clothing, um, which is, I can't stress how important, and I'm gonna go over some tips later uh, for that and how to do that, but uh, if it's too cold, we're, we're timid about giving up that extra layer of insulation, right? Um, and especially if it's too cold. Uh, it encourages the full 15 minute drench. Uh, I've heard awful stories of employees having to hold uh, fellow employees in the equipment to make sure that they rinse that chemical off because it is, it's way too cold or it's way too hot. Um, tepid water cools chemical burns. Um, if we're providing uh, you know, really hot water coming out of this emergency equipment, it can have some negative effects uh, on the chemicals that are already on your skin. So focusing on like an 85 degree uh, number for that temperature, uh, temperature of water coming out of the equipment is really important because it's going to cool that chemical um, and prevent uh, uh, more pain for the victim. Uh, it prevents chemical absorption. Uh, it closes the pores on our skin uh, rather than opening them when we have uh, scalding hot water coming out of the equipment. So if we're too hot on the scale, uh, we suffer severe scalding, especially of our eyes. Our eyes are sensitive tissues. Uh, normally your household showers, probably just north of about 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And that's fine for our skin, but you'd never, you would never stare up into your shower head uh, with hot water coming out of it. Um, the sensitive tissue on our eyes is, is much more uh, prone to injury than our, our skin. So s severe scalding is, is an issue. Uh, too cold and we risk the severe uh, hypothermia uh, as, along with the chemical exposure. So we need to make sure we're providing north of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they increase that in the next version of the standard. Now where the possibility of freezing conditions exist, and that's, that's most everywhere, even if you just have snap freezes uh, or it's really rare, if there's a possibility for it to freeze, it, their thinking with this was that it, it could be that day. That day, somebody might have that emergency, need that equipment, go to it, it be frozen, and then we're, we're dealing with a, a, a really bad day for both the employee and the employer. So we need to make sure that uh, freeze protected equipment is in place where, where they can freeze. Uh, now for some changes in the 2014 revision, um, the major changes. Um, emergency showers need to be designed so that they're manufactured and installed in such a manner that once activated, they can be used without the, requiring the use of the operator's hands. Um, I really want to stress how important this is. Self-closing valves are a thing of the past, and we need to make sure that they are um, hands-free, stay-open valves, okay? Um, and that, uh, I'm pretty talented. Um, but I can't remove my clothing, hold my eyes open, hold the eyewash open, and hold the shower open all at the same time. Uh, that's that's pretty crazy. Uh, that's, that's just not possible for somebody to do. Um, so making sure that they have their hands free to deal with emergencies uh, is very, very important. Now for the installation of the eyewash and the eye face wash equipment, this measurement was really important, and I'm really glad they did this. Um, 
and they made it so that the flushing fluid, the flow pattern from the heads uh, of the eye wash or the eye face wash cannot exceed 53 inches and cannot go below 33 inches. And this is important to prevent injurious flows. Um, that flushing fluid flow pattern also needs to be six inches clear from any wall so we don't hit our heads when we're trying to use the equipment. Um, the measurement was previously 45 inches, but that was from the floor to the top of the eye wash or eye face wash head, um, which allowed for the spray pattern to be whatever anybody wanted it to be, which is where injurious flow really came from. There was nobody monitoring that. But now we have a, a max of 53 inches preventing that injurious flow. This is a really important part of the uh, standard and any inclusion here. Uh, now in Appendix B, um, while we're not supposed to have any changes uh, in level from the hazard to the first aid equipment, uh, whether down or up, stairs, etc., there is a an exception here. A single step is allowed into an enclosure. So where the equipment can be accessed and is not considered to be an obstruction like you see on the right. So we cannot manufacture this type of equipment and this type of equipment is very important. Uh, we cannot make it level with the ground. Uh, these type of enclosures have to have a step to get into the booth. So they made an exception allowing a single step, but it's only into an enclosure. Where there is no enclosure, there is no change of level that is allowed. Now, weekly testing, weekly testing is another important change, uh, and it is so simple. On the right, you can see our 9011 test kit uh, that they're using, um, and the following steps are, are very simple. First, the emergency equipment needs to be activated on a weekly basis. The activation needs to ensure flow to the uh, heads of the device, that's it. Water needs to be coming out of the shower, water needs to be coming out of the eye face wash, and the, act, the duration of that activation needs to be long enough to clear the dead leg. And if you don't know what a dead leg is, there is a portion of piping between the emergency equipment and the source of water that is static. It's not moving. So we need to make sure we flush that water out uh, and get new water in there so we don't have any growth in the pipes. Okay. Now an annual inspection is the whole gamut. It needs to be the entire ANSI standard. You need to be testing, uh, reevaluating its location. You need to be checking the temperature. Uh, you need to run it for a full 15 minutes, which I understand it can be a really difficult thing to do for a lot of facilities to do. Um, a full 15 minutes, again, is going to put 345 gallons of water somewhere in your facility, and most places aren't prepared for that, that type of test or don't have the drainage for that. So, but there is specialized equipment out there to do this, um, and it needs to be done once a year. That's it. Uh, now, just for some recommended best, pra uh, best practices, I want to make sure that we have, um, uh, you know, we, we've seen so many things here at Haas, and being uh, one of the largest distributors of emergency equipment in the world, we want to make sure that we pass these on, on to you. So first, make sure you evaluate the equipment location. The equipment should be located in areas with adequate space for emergency responders to fill their response activities. Uh, emergency responders, if they need to work on you immediately, right out of the emergency equipment, they're going to need room to work or put you on a, a stretcher, a gurney, etc. So we need to make sure we have room for them to respond to the emergency. Make sure that you're training your employees on how to access and activate the equipment during an emergency. Um, the go-to for most manufacturers is a push flag for the eye wash and eye face wash and a pull rod for the shower. But some manufacturers have deviated from this, making it a little different for their equipment. So make sure they're trained on how to activate that equipment. We don't want them guessing when they get there. Uh, now, this is kind of just a bragging point for us. I like to bring this up. This is Z535.1. Uh, not, not, not the our ANSI standard that we've been going over for so far. We're going to deviate just for a second, um, but this is color coding for hazards. Now, red you'll notice is an emergency stop bar button on machinery. Yellow is caution, tripping, falling, striking hazards, and then orange is parts of a machinery or equipment that can hurt you, cut, crush, or uh, otherwise injure. Green, you might notice the particular color of a safety manufacturer that you might be attending a webinar of theirs, is uh, the location of safety equipment. So very important uh, color coding um, on emergency equipment. It should be green. Now, the correct, uh, correct equipment for the hazard is 
most important, when you're deciding what type of equipment is going to go in place, you need to keep these in mind, okay? Now, an eyewash is for airborne particulates, wood shavings, dust, anything that can fly up and is not going to harm your skin, okay? Uh, an eye face wash is for minor incidents affecting only the eyes and face. This typically means a heavily gowned uh, PPE type situation um, or with a low enough pH uh, that it, it's only going to affect your, your, your face and your eyes. Now a drench shower, not the most common, um, but this is a, a decontamination shower um, at its best. These are very rarely located by themselves, um, but when we think of uh, PPE decontamination, we're talking a full body suit, something we need to decontaminate before removing so as not to further uh, expose ourselves after we get out of that uh, equipment. Uh, personal protective equipment, if, you, if you're not sure what PPE means. Uh, now a combination unit, this is the most common um, and the most highly suggested, certainly by us, uh, type of equipment to have in place as this is perfect for any type of situation. Um, this is uh, particularly for chemical exposure of the eyes, face, and body, corrosives, et cetera. This is the type of equipment to have in place. Now, I want to suggest providing beyond tepid water. Now, the ANSI tepid water range is 60 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? But 60 degrees is, I don't know if you've ever jumped in 60 degrees water and hung out in there for 15 minutes, uh, it's cold. <laughs> it's not gonna feel the best. And then 100 degrees Fahrenheit, if you're sticking your eyeballs in it, is not gonna feel great. Uh, we'd really like to suggest um, everybody aim for about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of the, the, the key temperature. We're all comfortable at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I mean, my, my, my wife is gonna start, you know, bumping down the AC at home, but we're generally pretty comfy at 85 degrees. Now, if we're talking about water that's too cold, uh, again, so your average residential shower uh, is about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, temperatures in the lower end of tepid water range it can cause cold shock uh, that can potentially lead to cardiac arrest. Um, and it can drive the user out of the shower before his rinse is done. So we need to make sure that they're willing to stay in that equipment long enough to receive first aid. We don't want to drive them out of that equipment, right? Um, so we want to make sure it's it's tepid enough for them to stay in. Now, if it's too hot, we risk a lot of the same issues. Um, and uh, we have some other dangers here, uh, particularly Legionella. Uh, Legionella bacteria uh, growth thrives between 95 and 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, hotter kills it, lower, and it and it uh, hibernates, basically. Uh, it's non-dangerous. Uh, a range that uh, overlaps the current ANSI uh, tepid water range. So we have 95 degrees, which is sitting right in our tepid water range. So 85 degrees would be perfect. It's not going to encourage the growth. Um, and uh, and it's certainly not going to uh, unfortunately kill it. We can't provide over 150 degrees Fahrenheit through a, a piece of emergency equipment. We will hurt somebody. Now, while the ANSI standard does require a weekly flush to clear all piping sections that lead to emergency shower and eye face wash stations, avoiding temperatures that harbor bacteria is a, a valuable step in limiting the potential exposure to Legionella. Uh, for some additional best practices, first, uh, remove your contacts. Uh, do not rub your eyes. Um, contacts can trap the uh, contaminants between your eye and the contact lens, uh, making for some uh, additional issues that you're going to have to deal with and will not allow the water to properly flush and irrigate your eye. Disrobe completely, uh, including socks, including your shoes. Shoes can trap contaminants at the shower, so make sure you remove them once you get to the shower. Uh, completely disrobe. It is not uh, the time to be modest in front of your uh, coworkers. Uh, we want you to spend as little time in the hospital as possible. So you got to get into your birthday suit. Now provide privacy curtains. This is really important. Again, we, we want to take into consideration our, our fellow employees modesty, right? Uh, they're going to be going through an emergency, they're going to be disrobing, and we want to make sure that they do this in privacy, right? Um, so make sure that we're providing curtains uh, where you can. Uh, bump test before high risk tasks. So if you have a really high risk um, task that you're about to do at your facility and you have emergency equipment there, beyond the weekly tests, go over real quick, 
eye, eye face wash works, shower works, we're good to go. Just to make sure that you have the, your first aid equipment is going to work when you need it, just in case. Uh, be cautious while assisting somebody. Don't, uh, don't contaminate yourself. Um, sometimes the type of materials that we're going to get exposed to may be so harmful that simply touching them is going to, it's going to hurt you too. And then you need emergency first aid. So if it comes down to it, uh, be ready to verbally assist your coworker on how to get to emergency equipment as quick as possible. Okay. But don't hurt yourself. It's going to make the situation so much worse. Okay. Now for poll question number three, uh, hopefully this one goes smoothly. Let's hope so. Uh, we're definitely not done with the webinar. We want to make sure everyone sticks around for the live Q&A. We have had a flood of questions coming in, so thank you, everyone. Uh, but we'd like to know, what are you most likely to do after the webinar today? Are you planning on doing a full checklist? Uh, I'm sorry, a full test using the checklist that we're going to provide you? Um, are you going to contact somebody like Hawes Manufacturer for more information on the ANSI standard? Do you want to learn more about the Axion technology for eye face washes and showers and how you can retrofit your units to meet compliance? Um, or are you planning on purchasing any product to become compliant? Or are you 100% compliant? You have all Haas product and you don't need to do anything. Just kidding. Great, thanks everyone. Okay, uh, I'd like to take a second, uh, very quickly, I wanna talk about our survey program here at Haas. Um, this is a program I oversee personally. Um, and I, I first, I wanna bring up the, the chart on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, this is based on real data. Uh, it was an evaluation of over a thousand emergency units um and continuing uh we've surveyed so many sites it's just am amazing uh what comes back now you're going to notice that a, a certain slice of that pie is compliant 12 percent 12 percent compliance uh it's a staggeringly low number non-compliant other 10 percent uh basically means that uh someone was missing a sign um you know there was a, a step between the hazard and the emergency equipment something that's not gonna affect the performance of the emergency equipment. And then the gigantic Pac-Man size slice of our pie there is non-compliant for a performance related issue, nearly 80%, 80%. That gives you a one in five chance of getting to a piece of emergency equipment and it working the way it should, okay? Obviously that 20% is Haas equipment, but moving on, that uh, we need, this is a real number. So uh, a lot of performance related issues out there. Uh, the shower is not working correctly. The eye wash isn't working correctly. There's not enough water. There's too much water. Um, so we need to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to this. And one way that we can help you with this is our survey program. And what we do, we offer one full day of inspections. This is free of charge, one full day, completely free, complimentary, uh, an inspection report that is going to have photos detailing all of our findings uh, in your facility. Um, and an explanation of what's wrong, and uh, an executive summary chart uh, explaining in detail everything that we found. Uh, we're gonna provide you with recommendations on how to fix these, so we're not gonna leave you in the dark. We're not gonna say, this is broken, good luck. <laughs> we're gonna give you recommendations on how to fix these issues and help you along with the process. Um, we'll provide a debriefing meeting, a web conference with you and anybody else that would like to attend. Um, but there are, uh, are a couple restrictions uh, that do apply. If you have a portable eye wash that doesn't quite qualify, and we need to make sure that our reps are within a reasonable distance from your facility. So if you're interested, use the link or go to hosco.com and uh, we'll make sure that uh, you'll get in contact directly with me and I'll, I'll work out all the kinks for you. So um, moving on, uh, we, I wanna do one more poll question. Poll question number four, Sam, if you would uh, do that for me, please. I'm actually going to make it one step easier for anybody interested in that survey program. You can just hit yes on this poll question and we'll get you in contact um, with Justin and then potentially your local rep and see what we can do. One thing I wanted to clarify was, and we received this question a lot, does the survey program, will we only inspect existing Haas units? Absolutely not. We will inspect all brands and all competitors that you have on your facility.
Great. Thanks everyone for participating. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some other services that we have available really quickly. Um, we have a part of our company called Haas Services. Um, they are a warranty and service provider for all brands, once again, of emergency shower and eye wash products. Um, they have various different services, anything from startup and commissioning to conducting your annual ANSI inspections on every single piece of equipment that you have within your facility. There are facilities out there, and you may not know, that have over 2,000 pieces of emergency equipment, and that can be a absolute full-time job. So we have a team uh, located all across the U.S. and Canada that can assist in doing those annual inspections for you. Um, in the chat, I'm going to send everybody a link to the Haas Services page and you can uh, request more information and get in contact with them and get some uh, information on how we can assist you with your annual inspections. They also offer a 25-minute online competent inspector training course. This is great for those who want to conduct their own weekly and annual inspections. Uh, you simply go through a 25 minute uh, training presentation online, take a 20 question quiz, and you are then certified for two years. That cost is only $50. Um, and, and it really equips those who take it with the ability to effectively conduct weekly and annual inspections. So that's highly recommended for those who may already be doing inspections or may want to do it on their own if not already being done. Uh, Haas Services also offers repair and upgrades on emergency equipment. Um, warranty services and then they offer preventative maintenance contracts which can be anything including startup and commissioning repairs and upgrades uh, warranty work it also will include training on the ANSI Z358.1 standard um, and we can have contracts with your company as well so just wanted to I've sent that in the chat so go ahead and, and check out Haas services all right thanks Sam uh, okay, so uh, let's get down to the, the nitty-gritty of it. We'll get to our questions. Uh, I'm going to go over some of their our uh, um, uh, most frequently asked questions here um, that we've been getting. Uh, so uh, do the OSHA fine increases uh, apply in Canada? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, Canada doesn't follow uh, OSHA. They have the uh, CCOHS, uh, it's Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. Um, very similar to our OSHA, um, but operates a little differently. Um, Canada is a huge territory, uh, but not as jam-packed as the U.S. is. So, um, but there are they do have provincial and territorial uh, sections of their their uh, CCOHS as well, uh, each having its own occupational health and safety legislation uh, outlining general rights, responsibilities of the employer. Um, for the supervisor and for the worker. So uh, I have not seen anything about increases in fines, uh, but I would suspect that um, since uh, we've reevaluated, um, I'm sure they might be doing the same thing. Uh, what is required in the weekly test versus the annual test? Um, this, I, even though I, I ended up covering in the, uh, in the webinar, uh, this question gets answered or uh, asked all the time. Uh, so weekly tests, again, uh, turn on the equipment, Make sure that the eye wash or the eye face wash and the shower, we have water to the heads of the device, and then make sure it's long enough to clear out the dead leg. Another important note is uh, portable type equipment, self-contained equipment. Uh, no activation is required on self-contained equipment. All that you need to do is um, approach the equipment, open it up, make sure that there's enough flushing fluid for your full 15 minutes, uh, based on the manufacturer's uh, suggestions and requirements. And that's pretty much it. You just need to make sure there's enough water in there for a 15-minute flush and, and that there's no growth or anything like that in the water and you're good to go. Uh, let's see here. With the ANSI update, are existing eye face washes, showers, and drench hose stations also required to meet the new guidelines? Uh, this always comes back around too. Um, Basically, there, there's no grandfather clause in the ANSI standard, and if you don't understand necessarily what a grandfather clause is, it is a it's verbiage, it's cla a clause that is included in the standard saying, hey, if you have equipment prior to the release of this, you don't have to comply with it. Uh, so if this has already been in place and you're compliant at the time and then we release this, you're compliant. That is not the case with the ANSI standard. Whatever the current standard is is what we need to be complying with so 2014 
uh, current version, everything I just went over, that's what's required. Uh, last, does a door constitute an obstruction? Uh, so this one's, uh, a lot of people get confused about this. Again, a, a door does constitute an obstruction with an exception. Um, so that door has to meet certain requirements. Again, it has to be non-locking. It has to be push bar or panic bar operated, okay? Um, the hazard has to be non-corrosive and it has to open in the direction of the emergency equipment to be compliant, okay? Um, and I, I can't answer that any better. It's, it's hard, again, to describe, but as in certain situations, if you're gonna be trapped in the room with a contaminant, it's important to get out and we had to, they had to include that, um, that exception for a door. Okay, and then uh, moving on, what, what else we got, Sam? We have a handful of questions. So thank you everybody who sent anything in. As a reminder, if we don't get to your question during the live Q&A, we are sending out two follow-up emails. One is going to contain the link to the recording of today's webinar, along with some complimentary resources, including that ANSI checklist that will uh, bullet point out what is required on a weekly, basis as well as an annual basis um, and then a secondary follow-up email probably next week we'll send that out we'll include all of the questions with answers that we did and did not get to during the live q a so let's get to it justin um ingrid wants to know is there a quantifiable figure for non-injurious flow uh no there isn't so basically i mean a lot of it's 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 based on you and your opinion. Uh, the only measurement that we have in the ANSI standard preventing injurious flow is that 53 inch ceiling uh, that they gave us. That flushing fluid cannot exceed 53 inches in any way or it is non-compliant, okay? Um, but again, that's also based on your opinion. So if you're, if we have an eye wash based at, you know, uh, at the lowest end, 33 inches, um, but it's shooting up to 53 inches, uh, it depends on how comfortable you're going to be there. And um, so stick to that 53 inches. If it exceeds that, we consider it to be injurious flow. Um, but uh, again, we, we want to avoid anything that's going to be harmful to the, uh, to the victim. Uh, great. We would like to know what are the requirements and, I'm sorry, the frequency of inspection and does it require involvement of a certified or registered contractor? Nope. <laughs> so uh, basically, uh, weekly testing, uh, it could be you. Uh, you took this webinar, you're an ANSI professional now, you know what you're talking about. You could go out there and you could test an equipment, test equipment right now. Um, basically, all, the, all that's required, you don't have to have somebody that's certified or you don't have to pay somebody to do it. Uh, it could even be an employee that you have passed this information on to and you have told them all the requirements that is necessary. They need to go out there on a weekly basis activate the equipment, but it needs to be documented. Uh, whether that's a tag on the equipment, which is generally what we provide, um, or it's electronic, it has to be documented. Typically, if an OSHA inspector is there um, and they're interested in your emergency equipment, they're gonna ask for that proof that you've been doing weekly and annual testing. Um, and I don't think they, they necessarily care to, if, if you provide them with eight years of testing information or a week of testing information. They just want to know that you're doing it, that you're taking it seriously, um, and that this equipment is prepared for somebody that might need it. So uh, anybody can do it. Go out there, do weekly tests. Uh, it might be hard on an annual basis for uh, an employee to do that. So again, uh, something like cause services may be of, of, of help to you, um, but it does not take a professional or somebody with a certification. All right, uh, we'd like to know if the 69 inch pole rod meets ADA requirements. Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, uh, we have a, we provide extra long uh, pull rods and equipment that is specifically ADA, uh, um, meeting the ADA standards. So emergency equipment is kind of tricky. Um, in that it also follows a lot of the ADA requirements for a drinking fountain, uh, which is another product that we manufacture. Um, basically, uh, if you have, 
most facilities do not have ADA accessible first aid uh, emergency showers and eye washes. And the reason is in the ADA standard, if you have given somebody with disabilities access to that part of your facility, then it has to be meet the ADA requirements, which means that you need a lower eye face wash uh, to accommodate somebody in a wheelchair, a longer pull rod so that they can uh, then um, uh, so they can reach it from their wheelchair, uh, etc. Most of these manufacturing facilities and things like that uh, that don't give access to these parts of their facilities don't have to. They don't have the requirement to provide ADA accessible emergency equipment. So yes, longer pull rod, yes, lower eye face wash, um, but no, most facilities don't have that type of equipment because they don't allow access for uh, somebody who is handicapped. Um, but uh, it is important to note that in hospitals and things like that, it is important because you're going to have people that may need that equipment in those facilities. All right, um, Sandra's wondering, are there requirements for outdoor work where exposures may occur, for example, pesticide application? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a lot of uh, fields of work out there, um, say, for pesticide uh, um, application um, that absolutely do require this type of equipment. Um, unfortunately, it's really difficult to make this type of equipment and the amount of water that we need portable to the point where uh, somebody could always have access, you know, cause that, that driver, he's, he's driving around with that equipment, right? If there was a, a crash, an incident where there was a spill or something and somebody got exposed, I, we can't have a combination unit at every intersection in the city. Um, or at uh, corners of a, a manufacturing facility where none are warranted um, that he may be working. So yes, they do. There are uh, smaller bottles that can help that he could carry on his belt. Um, supplemental equipment, we call it. It's non-compliant if it's not being used in conjunction with a primary piece of equipment. Uh, but in these situations, something's better than nothing. So having that with him uh, could uh, potentially save his eyesight, uh, save his life. So. Um, it's really important, but uh, no, it's not. Uh, we talked about earlier in the appendix, um, a single step up into an enclosure is allowed as long as the enclosure is housing the piece of emergency equipment. So for example, a tempered water system uh, booth enclosure. Um, is there a height limit or measurement for what is meant by a single step? Uh, no, there's nothing defined in the ANSI standard as to um, what that has to be. Uh, that really just comes down to our common sense uh, and what we're determining is going to be accessible as a human being into that enclosure. Um, so th there's nothing saying giving us a measurement, um, but just use common sense. Somebody needs to be access, uh, get access to it. So we need to make that step short enough to so that they can gain access. But again, it's only a booth. It's a manufactured booth. It's uh, typically something you would order. And uh, as manufacturers, we're uh, adhering to the ANSI standard. We'll make sure that it's it's accessible and reasonable. All right, Justin, we're going to take one last question. Um, as you may see, there is a, a poll on the screen. I'd like to ask everybody what they thought about our webinar today. Um, don't forget, we have your contact information, so we may come after you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We hope you got a lot of good information from the webinar today. Um, and then the next slide, we'll have some contact information for you if you wanted to reach out to us. Um, so the last question is from Christopher. Um, in locations that don't have a supply of potable water, what are some solutions to provide emergency showers and eye washes? Um, so there's there's a couple different solutions. So uh, there are corners of your facility that aren't going to have access to potable water, right? Um, plumbed uh, or otherwise. Uh, Haas integrated um, would really be the way to go. Uh, the big yellow booths I showed you earlier on in the webinar, um, this type of equipment is designed to be self-contained, um, to temper its own water and to provide the victim with a, a comfortable experience. This would be one way to go. Um, the ANSI standard uh, gives us the definition of flushing fluid as potable water um, or medically uh, treated water, uh, like saline solution. Um, so 
but either one of those uh, are, are perfectly acceptable. Self-contained equipment is really the answer to that, whether it be a portable, if it's just airborne contaminants, or Haas Integrated, these big yellow booths, if it's something more severe. So that's really the way to go, uh, self-contained, and uh, it'll it'll be compliant uh, with your with your needs. Um, so uh, I, I advanced the slide. This is our contact information. Uh, again, my name is Justin Dunn. Um, reach out to us or our customer service team if you have questions. Uh, I really appreciate you attending. Um, this is uh, one of uh, our, our favorite things to do uh, here is to hold this webinar and to help educate people on the ANSI standard. So uh, really uh, deeply and truly thank you for joining us for this and reach out to us if you have any questions about compliance or the ANSI standard. And thank you. Thanks, have everyone. A have a great day.